When we talk about made in America, what usually comes to mind are Boeing aircraft, Tesla cars, and all those high-tech products from Silicon Valley. After all, companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft were all born in America, and their designs lead global tech trends. This is the most ironic business reality of the 21st century. The country with the world's most advanced technology can't actually manufacture a single made-in-USA smartphone. In the second quarter of 2025, Indian manufactured phones captured 44% of the US market share, while Chinese manufacturing dropped from 61% to 25%. And American domestic manufacturing? Practically zero. The world's most powerful economy has become nothing more than a spectator in this trillion dollar smartphone industry. So what's really going on here? How did America go from being a manufacturing powerhouse to being unable to produce even a single smartphone? Back in the 1950s, on the assembly lines of Detroit, Ford workers could put together a car every minute. Back then, Made in USA was the gold standard for quality worldwide. From Coca-Cola to IBM mainframes, American-made products could be found in every corner of the globe. There was a classic story from that era. A Japanese businessman wanted to learn American manufacturing techniques, but American engineers arrogantly believed the Japanese would never master it because it required generations of accumulated knowledge. After World War II, American manufacturing accounted for over 40% of global output. The US had the world's most complete industrial system, covering everything from steel smelting to precision machinery, from chemical pharmaceuticals to electronic equipment. America could do it all. In those days, a high school graduate working at General Motors could buy a house, a car, and support an entire family on a middle-class lifestyle. But beneath this prosperity lurked a fatal problem cost. By the 1970s, the average hourly wage for American workers was five times that of Japanese workers and 20 times that of Korean workers. As global trade barriers gradually lowered, these cost differences began to show their power. More crucially, American entrepreneurs started believing in what seemed like perfect business logic. Why do all that dirty, exhausting manufacturing work at home when we could focus on higher value-added design and innovation? In 1975, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs was still assembling computers in his garage, but he was already thinking, what kind of company should Apple become in the future? History proved that this seemingly smart choice planted the seeds for today's predicament. In 1981, Apple had just launched the Apple II computer. Sales were booming, but cost pressures were enormous. CEO John Scully at the time proposed a revolutionary idea, move production to Asia. Scully's logic was simple. Apple should focus on what it did best, innovation and design, and let Asia do what they did best, manufacturing. The impact of this decision was far-reaching. Japan benefited first, with companies like Sony and Panasonic quickly becoming Apple's manufacturing partners. Then came Korea, where Samsung transformed from a small trading company into a global electronics giant. Finally, China. Starting in the 1990s, cities like Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Suzhou became the new centers of global manufacturing. In 1985, Apple's factory in Fremont, California, employed 2,000 workers to produce computers. Workers earned $15 per hour, and with benefits, the total cost was about $25 per hour. The same work in Korea cost only $2, and in China, less than $1. This wasn't just about cost, it was an efficiency revolution. Asian factories' production efficiency amazed Americans. The Japanese invented lean production, Koreans created rapid response, and the Chinese demonstrated economies of scale. By the late 1990s, it took only six months to go from design to mass production of a phone in Asia, while in America it took two years. Other Silicon Valley giants followed suit. Intel moved chip packaging to Malaysia, Microsoft outsourced software testing to India, and Cisco handed network equipment manufacturing over to Taiwan. Each move brought massive cost savings and efficiency improvements. In 1999, Business Week published a cover story titled The Death of Manufacturing, predicting America would become a purely innovation economy. 
The article argued that the future belonged to companies that could design and sell products, not manufacture them. Nobody realized at the time that this seemingly perfect division of labor was planting seeds for future crises. While America gained enormous economic benefits, it was also losing something more fundamental, manufacturing capability. On January 9, 2007, Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This world-changing product had an interesting detail. The prototype Jobs displayed on stage had no manufacturing markings on the back, but everyone knew these phones were assembled in China. The iPhone's success ushered in the smartphone era and pushed global manufacturing division to its extreme. Let's follow an iPhone's global journey. Designed in California, chips manufactured in Korea, screens from Japan, cameras from Germany, and final assembly at Foxconn's factory in Zhengzhou, China. The efficiency of this global division of labor was astonishing. Foxconn's Zhengzhou factory covered 1.4 square kilometers, employed 350,000 workers, operated 24-7, and produced an average of 350 iPhones per minute. The facility had its own fire department, hospital, and even a TV station. This wasn't just a factory, it was an iPhone city. Apple's success inspired other American tech giants to follow suit. When Google launched its first Android phone in 2005, it chose Taiwan's HTC as its manufacturer. Amazon's Kindle was produced in China, Microsoft's Surface was assembled in Vietnam. Not a single American tech giant chose to manufacture smart devices domestically. The economic logic of this choice was flawless. In 2010, New York Times journalist Charles Duhigg, after investigating Apple's manufacturing process in depth, wrote, iPhones are made in China not just because it's cheap, but because it's efficient. When Apple needs to mobilize 8,000 engineers overnight, that can be done in China, but it's impossible in America. One month before the iPhone launch in 2007, Jobs suddenly decided to switch from plastic screens to glass screens. In America, this would have meant at least six months of preparation time, but Foxconn completed the switch in 15 days, mobilizing tens of thousands of workers and reconfiguring entire production lines. By 2017, American tech companies' dependence on Asian manufacturing had reached unprecedented levels. Apple had over 200 suppliers in China, Google's hardware was almost entirely manufactured in Asia, and even Tesla's batteries depended on Japanese and Korean suppliers. That year, Donald Trump was elected US president, and one of his statements foreshadowed challenges for this perfect system. We're going to bring manufacturing back to America. In July 2018, the US imposed 25% tariffs on $34 billion worth of Chinese goods, officially launching the trade war. Silicon Valley CEOs suddenly found that their carefully constructed global supply chains had become hostages in political gamesmanship. Apple felt the impact first. Tim Cook flew urgently to Washington, where he showed Trump a complex supply chain diagram. A single tiny screw in an iPhone could involve suppliers from 12 different countries. Cook warned that if tariffs were imposed on all Chinese goods, iPhone costs would rise by 20%. Facing pressure, tech giants began searching for China alternatives. Apple moved some production to India, Google's Pixel phones shifted to Vietnam manufacturing, and Microsoft's Xbox production lines moved to Mexico. But they quickly discovered that leaving China wasn't easy. In 2019, Apple's contract manufacturer in India experienced a strike over workers protesting food quality. This seemingly minor conflict cost Apple millions of iPhones in production capacity. Even worse, Indian factories had only a 70% yield rate, while Chinese factories achieved over 95%. Meanwhile, the US government began pushing for manufacturing to return home. In 2017, Foxconn announced a $10 billion investment to build an LCD panel factory in Wisconsin, with Trump personally attending the groundbreaking ceremony, calling it an eighth wonder of the world. However, the project soon ran into trouble. The Wisconsin project's failure revealed the fundamental difficulties of manufacturing return. First was cost. American workers' hourly wages were more than 10 times those of Chinese workers. Second was skills. America had already lost its manufacturing skill base. Most critically was the ecosystem. 
China had a complete supply chain network, while America needed to rebuild from scratch. In 2021, Foxconn cut the Wisconsin project investment from $10 billion to $672 million and jobs from 13,000 to 1,500. This manufacturing return model that had been placed with such high hopes ultimately became nothing more than a political show. Ironically, Chinese manufacturing didn't decline during this period, but actually became stronger. During the 2020 pandemic, when global supply chains were thrown into chaos, Chinese factories were the first to resume production. Apple's financial reports showed that even during the most intense period of the trade war in 2019, China still contributed 20% of Apple's revenue. In 2025, a set of data from research firm Canalis shocked the entire tech world. Behind these numbers lay profound changes in the global manufacturing landscape. India, formerly just a software outsourcing center, had suddenly become the largest supplier to the US smartphone market. In the second quarter of 2025, Indian manufactured phones captured 44% of the US market, compared to 13% in the second quarter of 2024, an increase of 240%. That means out of every 10 phones sold in America, 4.5 came from India. Even more surprising was China's sharp decline in manufacturing share. It plummeted from 61% in the second quarter of 2024 to 25%, meaning China lost over one third of its US phone market share in just one year. This was the largest market share loss since China became the world's factory. But these numbers tell a complex story. Apple CEO Tim Cook revealed in the second quarter 2025 earnings call that Apple's factories in India could now produce iPhone 16 Pro series, but still needed time to match the efficiency and quality standards of Chinese factories. The data also showed another trend, weakness in US domestic smartphone demand. US smartphone shipments grew only 1% in the second quarter of 2025, the lowest growth rate in recent years. Weakening consumer spending, combined with price pressures from tariffs, was affecting the entire market's vitality. One detail worth noting, while manufacturing locations were changing, core technology remained in the hands of a few companies. Qualcomm chips, Apple's A-series processors, Google's Tensor chips, these key components were still designed in America. Manufacturing could be transferred, but the core of innovation remained in Silicon Valley. This differentiation was also reflected in market performance. In the second quarter of 2025, Apple's US market share reached a historic high of 57%, but iPhone shipments fell 11% year over year. Behind this seemingly contradictory data was market polarization, the high-end market concentrated around Apple, while the mid to low-end market remained highly competitive. Vietnam also benefited from this supply chain reshuffling. Samsung moved most of its phone production to Vietnam, making it an important pillar of that country's manufacturing industry. Data showed that Vietnamese manufactured phones accounted for 30% of US imports, making it the second largest supplier after India. But these changes didn't benefit American manufacturing. While tariff policies pushed supply chain transfers, production bases mainly shifted to other low-cost countries rather than returning to America. The biggest beneficiaries of this trade war weren't American manufacturing, but India and Vietnam. Amid all the pessimistic voices saying, America can't make phones, there's a company in Carlsbad, California, doing what seems impossible. Every morning at 8 a.m., Purism CEO Todd Weaver makes his rounds through the factory, watching workers assemble Librem 5 USA phones, the world's only truly made-in-USA smartphone. On Weaver's office wall hangs an FTC, Federal Trade Commission, certification, proving that the Librem 5 USA meets strict made-in-America standards. This isn't just any ordinary certificate, it represents the last glimmer of hope for American smartphone manufacturing. But the trade-off is price. The Librem 5 USA sells for $1,999, while the same configuration made in China costs only $1,299, a $700 difference. That $700 gap represents the true cost of American manufacturing. 
Walking into Purism's factory, you see a completely different world from Foxconn. There are no spectacular scenes of hundreds of thousands of workers, just fewer than 100 employees working quietly. Each workstation is spacious, workers wear neat uniforms, and operate precision placement machines. Weaver explained the company's business logic. The key was choosing a different business model, not pursuing price competition, but focusing on value creation. Purism's customers are willing to pay a premium for data security, privacy protection, and American manufacturing. This business model actually works. Purism is a profitable company with annual revenues in the tens of millions of dollars, with the American-made Librem 5 USA contributing nearly one-third of revenue. The company maintains triple-digit growth rates annually, proving that American manufacturing is viable in specific markets. Even this most steadfast advocate of American manufacturing can't completely escape global supply chains. Their core NXP processor chips come from Korea, Wi-Fi chips from Taiwan. Weaver admits that completely American manufacturing is impossible in reality, but the company sources as much as possible domestically. Purism's success also proves an important point. Modern phone manufacturing doesn't require massive human labor. If the manufacturing process relies mainly on machines, then labor costs aren't the determining factor. The real differences lie in economies of scale, supply chain efficiency, and ecosystem completeness. Purism's very existence proves a paradox. America can indeed manufacture phones, but only on a very small scale for very specialized markets. It's like a lone beacon, shining a weak but determined light in the darkness of manufacturing. America has the world's most advanced chip design capabilities, the most powerful software ecosystems, and the most innovative tech companies. Every core iPhone technology comes from America, A-series chip architecture designed in California, iOS operating system developed in Cupertino, Face ID technology researched in Texas. The real problem lies in choice, but this choice also brought unexpected consequences. Manufacturing isn't just simple assembly work, it's a complex ecosystem involving skill accumulation, process optimization, and supply chain coordination. When America abandoned manufacturing, it lost not just factories, but the entire manufacturing ecosystem. 2025 data shows that even under trade war and pandemic shocks, manufacturing didn't return to America, but shifted to other low-cost countries like India and Vietnam. This shows that the core factors determining manufacturing layouts are economic laws, not political will. Purism's success proves the technical feasibility of American phone manufacturing, but its limited scale also demonstrates this model's limitations. In today's globalized world, complete domestic manufacturing is neither economical nor realistic. Perhaps the real question isn't whether America can manufacture phones, but whether domestic manufacturing is still necessary in a highly globalized world. After all, when you use an iPhone, what matters isn't where it was assembled, but what value it creates for you. America is paying the price for choices made decades ago, and that price might be more expensive than anyone imagined.